Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome renowned physicist Dr. Lawrence Krauss, the author of The Physics of Star Trek, to the show, talking about his new book, The Physics of Climate Change. But first, we're going to take a look at a new study that may have found the final resting place of the ancient water of Mars. In other watery news, we look at how life may be hiding on ocean worlds within our own solar system. Finally, We'll take another glimpse at Aumuamua, the odd body which visited our family of planets in 2017. Four billion years ago, Mars was a water world, home to mighty oceans, rivers, and lakes. However, liquid water disappeared from the surface of the red planet long ago. But where did all that water go? It has often been suggested that this water was lost to space due, in part, to the relatively light force of gravity on Mars. However, a new study out of Caltech examined ratios of two types of hydrogen in the Martian atmosphere, finding evidence that most of that ancient water may still be trapped to this day within clays held in the crust of the red planet. The laws of chemistry and physics suggest the possibility that oceans of water on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, as well as hydrocarbon seas on Saturn's moon Titan, might give rise to alien life forms on these intriguing worlds of our solar system. The oceans of Europa covered in ice, as well as the dense atmosphere of Titan, might assist in protecting life on these worlds from radiation and meteorite impacts. However, Researchers speculate these same conditions could also make it more difficult to discover life hidden within these oceans and under thick atmospheres both in our solar system and beyond. In 2017, our solar system was visited by a mysterious object from beyond our family of planets. A wide range of theories were put forward attempting to explain the odd nature of Aumuamua, including the unlikely notion that it was a spacecraft designed by an intelligent civilization. New research now shows that Aumuamua was likely shaped like a giant cookie covered in solid nitrogen. The study also reveals that this object may have broken off of a Pluto-like world in another stellar system less than half a billion years ago. On March 30th, we're going to talk with astronomer Alan Jackson as well as astrophysicist Stephen Daesh about, of Arizona State University about their work uncovering the mysteries of Aumuamua. Make sure to join us then. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. But next up, we talk with Dr. Lawrence Krauss about climate change, science, and Star Trek tech. Engage.
This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Lawrence Krauss. He is a theoretical physicist and president of the Origins Project Foundation and host of the Origins Podcast with Lawrence Krauss. Welcome to the show, Lawrence. Well, it's nice to be with you virtually. It's nice to yeah. be with you. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, in, you're in space. I'm in Oregon, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the food up here is great, but yeah, it really yeah. lacks atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, you are actually probably best known for writing one of my favorite uh, science books of all time, The Physics of Star Trek. Yeah. But your new book, uh, The Physics of Climate Change, is recently out. Can you tell us what inspired you to write this new book? Yeah. I, I'll say, I, by the way, I will say that the title was inspired by The Physics of Star Trek, I thought. If I could, in some sense, be, partly because I want to convince people that climate change isn't rocket science, and if I could write a book about rocket science, even imaginary rocket science, then I could talk about climate change. What inspired me was, first of all, actually, frankly, was the time I had because of the pandemic. I, mm. uh, I've been thinking about climate change a lot, and I'm not a climate scientist, but I have, through various one parts of my hats, I was chairman of the board of the Bolton Atomic Scientists for years, and thought about these issues and was tutored by colleagues. Uh, I've been thinking about it. And then I led a group of people going up the um, Mekong River, or down the Mekong River, actually, from Cambodia to Vietnam. And I was lecturing on climate change, uh, which, of course, caused me to do some research. And then it was it, I really hit home when I was there, the immediacy of what's going to happen there because of the, it's kind of a perfect storm because of the fact that most of the country is less than a meter above sea level. Mm. And sea level rise is going to be close to a meter this in this century, no matter what we do. That really brought it home because too often climate change is kind of out there. It's kind of impersonal. And it really hit me because of this wonderful culture of people who survived wars and genocides. And yet now we're going to face something that was even more dramatic and it wasn't of their own doing. And then um, and then when I was when I was home and my, my events and, and travel was canceled and I I was trying to think, what can I do? I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll try and write a book. And boy, this. It was it was a unique experience for me. I've written eleven books, and and uh, and this one, um, because I had I didn't have one or two or three other day jobs at the same time. Uh, I wrote it in twelve weeks, which is uh, I've never written a book in under a year. Wow! And uh, um, you know, just about fifteen hours a day. It just it just flowed. I was surprised. I mean, now I don't remember. I never remember writing any of my books. It's like labor, but it's uh, but but. <laughs> But I know it flowed quickly, and and uh, and the sense of it, it, it really came together nicely. I, I'm very happy with it, and people have reacted well. But I got a sense of of of, in my opinion, how well it flowed, pieced together when I did the audiobook. So I've I've read six of my audiobooks, and and this one I expected to take three days over maybe sixteen hours, and and I read it in um, about eight, seven and a half hours which it just went right through and because it, it flows. So it's a short book, which is important, I think, because this is, a, you know, I'm trying to get people to have some perspective of, of, a, of an issue, which which is going to be important for science and public policy. And uh, and it's important to me that it not be intimidating. In fact, I think generally science books should be short anyway. Um, right. But but so anyway, so I guess the thinking that I could, what could I do to help people during the pandemic? I, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not, but maybe I could write a book that would help inform people that would help them talk to others and ultimately uh, maybe affect the way they vote. And, and in fact, the, my foundation is going to be, I just signed 535 copies last week because my foundation is sending a copy to every, uh, every um, congressman, every member of the new Congress. And so they will do that in the next week or two. So that's going to be neat. All right. Of course, it'll be. Challenging to see uh, how many of them actually read it. Right? Yeah, well, well, at least they're staffers. I mean, I, I don't expect all of them will do. But I, I've, I've talked to Congress before. I've talked. I've, I've been testified before Congress. But I've also lectured to con Congress people and their staffers, and the staffers work pretty hard. So my hope is that oh, sure at do. least the staffers will, will do it. All right. We'll, we'll read it. All right. So I know you just spent, you know, a whole book um, writing about this. But can you just give us a brief rundown of how does the Earth normally balance its temperature, and what the heck is going on going wrong now? Okay, well, well, 
it, well, it's changing. I guess you can say it's going wrong, but um, uh, uh, the the point you got the point right. The, the, in general, it's really a quite a simple physics expression: energy in equals energy out if nothing's right. changing. If the energy in is equal to energy out, the temperature and everything else remains the same. And and the energy in, of course, comes from the sun. Um, you know, somewhere above you in or orbit there, some you look out in the sun, and and it's and that I'm at, that's not changing at least on on sort of human time scales, um, and uh, or you know, over the last century, say. Um, but so so uh, in the best of all possible worlds, the Earth is radiating out the same amount of energy it's rating in, uh, it's, it, that's raining in on it. In fact, the first calculation of that was by a guy named Fourier, a very famous uh, mathematical physicist and physicist. And he, he said, okay, if energy out is equal to energy in, and I know the energy in come from the sun, what should the temperature of the earth be so it will radiate out? And, and the, all you have to know is that the radiation goes, it turns out the fourth power of temperature. Mm -hmm. He plugged it in, he found out the earth should be at minus 18 degrees Celsius, which it isn't. Uh, if it was, it'd be frozen solid. And so there must be something happening here. And he kind of realized that the atmosphere might form a blanket. And um, I, I kind of walk people through that. But the key point is, there's two points here. The, at, the atmosphere, because of carbon dioxide and also water, but carbon dioxide up in the upper atmosphere, is opaque to certain amounts of infrared radiation. Solar radiation comes in the visible band. You can look out on a nice sunny day and see the sun. So it gets through the atmosphere. But the Earth, of course, radiates, and it, it, that radiation is heat, which is infrared radiation. And the atmosphere absorbs a lot of that. So, and the more carbon dioxide, the more infrared radiation is absorbed and then re-radiated back down to Earth instead of into space. So the way to think about it is that somewhere a little below where you're sitting out in space there at the top <laughs> of the atmosphere, um, Below that, the atmosphere is opaque to radiation. So at the very top of the atmosphere, that's what it's radiating into space, okay? Mm -hmm. And that radiation into space has to balance the radiation coming in for things to work out, okay? But if, if we increase the carbon dioxide abundance, then the atmosphere is a little more opaque and you have to go to a slightly higher altitude before it becomes transparent. Right. But at higher altitudes, it's colder. And since, and since the radiation goes as the fourth power of temperature, that means the Earth isn't quite radiating as much at that higher altitude as it would have at a lower altitude. And that difference is the effect of, of global warming, of cli causing climate change. It's about two to three watts per square meter average over the Earth. And there's a lot of square meters in the surface of the Earth. And that extra energy is due to simply the fact that the Earth isn't quite radiating out as much as it was before because of that additional carbon dioxide. That's what we call radiative forcing. And that is the one, if you want to pick one number that parameterizes the effects of what, of what humans have been doing, radiative forcing is probably the best thing because it tells you there's extra energy coming into Earth. Now, what it does is, you know, it's more, sometimes more complicated if you're, if you're worrying about ocean currents or, or even precipitation, but, you all, but, but simple estimates can tell you that what you would expect given the radiative forcing that's happened over the last 60 or 100 let's say 120 years is that the earth would have heated up by maybe 1.3 degrees celsius and you know what when you look that's how much it's heated up by now correlation isn't causation but but if you have a if you have a simple explanation that explains it then then and that that's a really the, the key thing about climate change is that Fundamental physics is 200 years old almost, 150 years old anyway, makes predictions about what should be happening and that's what we're observing. Now there could be some vast cosmic conspiracy that somehow, you know, the simplest possible explanation is wrong and some other factors are coming in, but because this not only is the simplest explanation, in, is it consistent with, with data, but, but the predictions which you can make are all consistent with data. And therefore you have a physical reason for that correlation. And if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. At least a bird. <laughs> uh, now in uh, 2015, you headed out uh, to the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, what, did, what did you learn there? What, what, what it was we... one of the most, yeah, it's, ama it's an amazing experience. I mean, it's the wildest seas in the world. What I really learned was how much I admired Shackleton. Because even <laughs> in a big boat, in a big boat going across that, the, the, that body of water from South America, 
the Antarctica. It's it, it, big ships are going like this, and they were in a little boat. It's just amazing. But you see, first of all, you get a perspective for me, a perspective of what the planet is like without humans in some sense, because it's so vast and there's no humans there. I mean, you know, there's little settlements of researchers here or there, but everywhere you go, it's just, it's, it's, it's nature, it's penguins, it's, 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 it's that. but you also get the sense of, of, of the dramatic changes that are happening. Uh, um, in my book, there's a picture of by current scale scales, a rather small iceberg, but it still goes as far as the eye can see. And you know, while I was while I was down there, and a little bit afterwards, two two large ice shelves broke off the size of, of almost Delaware. One of them. Now that doesn't change sea level rise, by the way, because they're floating already. Mm -hmm. But what what happens when those ice shelves break off is they're holding back the glaciers on the land. They're buttressing them. When they break off, the glaciers can go into the water, and that does raise uh, sea level. And if the west, and, and there's no doubt the West Antarctic ice sheet is is becoming unstable at some level. And if the entire ice sheet, West Antarctic ice sheet goes, that would be over about two to three meters of sea level rise over the course of a few centuries. And, you know, it, it is unstable uh, and you can see it. And so uh, it's a combination of seeing the effects of climate change and also somehow realizing that the earth is far, you know, that the earth has been around for a long time and it's going to be around for a long time, regardless of whether we're here, we're here to enjoy it. And it's really up to us to to figure out, uh, you know, the kind of planet we want to live on. That's amazing. And of course, you know, I'm not going to let an opportunity to talk with you pass without without talking some Star Trek tech. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, if you as much. <laughs> if you, I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, if you could take have just one uh, Star Trek technology come come into existence what would it be and why well the reason you know one of the things that got me interested in writing that book was the transporter i i, I was talking to my editor in new york about and she joke was joking with me because her daughter was a trekker and she said what about the physics star trek and i laughed i took the i was teaching at yale at the time i took the train back up to new haven and as i was on the train i started to think well how would i make a transporter if i wanted to make a transporter mm. and and it was fascinating to think about of course by the way you can't but um but all of the things you have to consider were fascinating to me and especially as someone who used to travel a lot i'd much rather go on a transporter mm. even if it, even if it does produce weird side effects at least if the doctor <laughs> said dr mccoy says he doesn't <laughs> like it but um uh i so i think that would be nice unfortunately it's not going to happen um, the, uh, uh, you know, another another technology that will happen at some level, already is at some level, uh, and I predicted at the time I wrote it, which is more than 25 years ago, that would be around now, and I guess I was optimistic, but, you know, the holodeck, hmm. being able to go into a room where holograms are showing and you feel like you're in Paris. I, I'd said I thought there'd be restaurants with the streets of Paris projected in three dimensions and you could be sitting there. It was just a matter, we had the technology, it's just a matter of computer technology getting better, better and better. But the holodeck's nice. Again, part of it is realistic. You could imagine three-dimensional images, but there's no holodeck matter. <laughs> Holograms, you can put your hand through them. So as nice as they are, you can't interact with them in the way that the Star Trek crew could. Crew could. And of course, nevertheless, what probably is intellectually the most fascinating, and for me, maybe the most interesting episodes is were the ones involving time travel because time travel is so fascinating and there's always paradoxes of time travel every time you think about it and so when you start to think about it you get you get um you get wrapped up in it. in fact i used to have a debate or, well i mean i had a discussion with my friend stephen hawking who wrote the foreword for that book and um and he used to say time travel was impossible because if it were possible we'd already be inundated by tourists from the future and I, I countered him by saying they all went back to the 1960s and no one noticed. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually might think 2020 would be a time they would want to avoid. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to be here now. The 60s were an interesting time. And, you know, there were so many weird people. Maybe some of them were time traveling. Uh, and just real quick, um, do you think, well, ever, I mean, there was just, just saw a paper about, you know, possible theoretical reasons to believe that we may be able to warp space and you know there's a Don't new paper no. i write about it in the book and not much has changed since i've read the book i mean 
the point is general relativity allows in principle for you to go from one place to another faster than light. You're not really traveling. You're, you're causing space to right. contract in front of you and expand behind you. So right. theoretically, if you have the right configuration of energy, that would be possible. But the right configuration of energy is either impossible or prohibitively uh, large, more than the mass of our galaxy. M moreover, what people, and I've read these things, and I once talked to NASA about this because NASA, for some reason, was fixated on this, even though it's ridiculous. Um, and that, unfortunately, NASA does that every now and then. But what people don't seem to realize is even then, you're not, you're, you're not ever getting from A to B faster than light. Because in order to get space between you and the star, to take near a star to comp compress, and space between you and the Earth to expand. But in particular, if you want to get all the space between you and the star to, you know, catastrophically compress, so you're now near the nearest star, you have to seed all of that space with the right kind of energy mm. to carry the right kind of energy out to that kind of space. But that you can only do with sublight speeds. So mm -hmm. let's say, you know, you want to go to the Alpha Centauri four light years away. Well, it might take you 100,000 years to get everything prepared, and then you could travel there in a second. But but it's not as if you're, it's not as if you're, uh, you know, in principle, but yeah, so it's not as if you're ever going to get around this um, annoying cosmic speed limit and uh, for practical purposes. And so whatever you may read about NASA and warp drive, rocket ships are for better or worse the way to go. Even when your rocket ships powered by solar sails, maybe, but, but, um, but it's going to take a long time to go out there. And, and um, if we're going to travel in, in, outside of our solar system, it's going to be in large kind of colony ships, not in small spacecraft traveling around at the speed of light, unfortunately. And that, you know, that's the bad news. The good news is uh, aliens aren't coming here to kidnap us and do weird kinky experiments. So we're okay. <laughs> okay. So one, just last question. I uh, just want to wrap these two books together. Yeah. You can, you have a chance to bring one Star Trek technology to life to help save, to help uh, solve climate change. How do you do it? Well, let's uh, you know. I suppose uh, that's an interesting question. Um, the uh, <laughs> I suppose what you what I would do is um, since it's not since Star Trek isn't practical anyway, and I'm not worried about <laughs> practicality. Um, I just I just I do have the trans the transporter go on very wide mode, picking up the signals of carbon dioxide, and I transport carbon dioxide a lot large amounts of carbon dioxide from our atmosphere out into space. <laughs> there you go. Set set Jordy on it right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. Well, it was, it was great talking with you, Lawrence. It was it was it was great fun. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for being Thanks. on the show. And that was Dr. Lawrence Krauss, author of The Physics of Climate Change, now available from Post Hill Press. Join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion when we'll talk to astronomer Alan Jackson and astrophysicist Stephen Desch of Arizona State University about their study uncovering the secrets of Aumuamua. Subscribe or follow today and never miss an episode. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, Please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. 
For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.